Marhaban. Welcome. Welcome to the Yassi World Research and Rescue Center. I am Dr. Elis Marquis and I thank you all for attending tonight's science talk. This is number 10, so yeah. yeah there you go. Um, and I'm glad to see uh, many of you tonight. As you know, this area of science talk at the center is developed in partnership with the Environment Agency Abu Dhabi, Emirates Natural History Group Abu Dhabi, the Natural History Museum Abu Dhabi and Nautica Environmental Associates. And today, it will be all about sea turtles. And just for the story, I spent the day yesterday uh, with high school students and I had among a lot of other biofacts a skull of green turtle. They had to find out what it was, and the most common first guess was a dinosaur. <laughs> well, they were not that far because obviously sea turtles, and we may learn that later, have been with us or on Earth at least for millions and millions of years. Um, but I'm sure, again, we are going to discuss that later on. Um, and actually, this science talk is coming after two important moments uh, for the sea turtles conservation effort of the UAE. This talk is actually the final event, closing the very exciting Marine Turtle Festival organized by the Environment Ag Agency Abu Dhabi, during which 214 turtles, sea turtles were um, rehabilitated and actually returned to the Gulf last week. And it's also uh, coming just after the celebration of the 20th uh, anniversary of the Dubai Turtle Rehabilitation Project. So, um, yeah, we are very, very glad that we are just part of this um, nice moment for the sea turtle of the year. Um, needless, to, needless to say that I am very honored to both have the EAD and the Dubai Turtle Rehabilitation Project uh, as part of the talk with two amazing sea turtle heroes. Uh, Dr. Hint, Anna Mary, and Barbara Langdenton. I am very happy as well to have in the room some uh, more turtle, sea turtle heroes. I've seen some, part, some members from the uh, Sadia Turtle Patrol, and um, they, I think they are waiting very patiently to have some um, sea turtle babies coming out of the nest, so hopefully soon. Um, we will have two talks tonight and then a panel discussion with our two speakers and I will have the honor to have our amazing uh, very own Dr. Clark coming to uh, on stage with us to talk about the rehabilitation, rehabilitation uh, efforts uh, for sea turtles. As usual again uh, we keep the question for the end we will make sure we have enough time for the question and without any further ado, uh, ado uh, let me welcome Dr. Hint Anna Marie on stage. First, just to introduce her, um, I'm very, very proud to have her coming here. Dr. Hint is a marine conservation scientist and she has been with the Environment Agency Abu Dhabi since 2014, right? Uh, she has a PhD in biological sciences from the University of Exeter and she leads the EAD's marine species program focusing on marine turtles. Hey, this is good because we're going to talk about marine turtles. Um, Dr. Alamari is passionate about biodiversity conservation and, and I just actually learned that, but I need to have a, a, a copy of it. She is also a, a author of children's book. So, um, and um, really I'm honored to have her on stage. She's been with, like, following the center since the beginning because she was here right at the start for the inauguration event uh, with us. So welcome on stage. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum and good evening, Dr. Elise. Thank you very much for that very humbling introduction. And to all of you for being with us this evening, spending your Thursday night to talk about something that I'm very passionate about, a very fascinating creature, the sea turtles. So uh, today I'll take you on a journey on the life cycle of a sea turtle and then we'll dive into knowing more about the conservation efforts here in Abu Dhabi and later hopefully from the uh, Dubai Rehab Center about the UAE-wide uh, rescue and rehabilitation programs. So as Dr. Elise mentioned, sea turtles, our ancient mariners, have been navigating the earth 
Earth's waters for over 100 million years. They've been around since the time of the dinosaurs. And I personally think if sea turtles can talk, they would have been great storytellers to tell us what has happened in the past. They've had a meteoric rise from once being a fisheries resource to now being a conservation icon. Sea turtles are not just captivating creatures to observe. They are, or they play a crucial role in maintaining the health of our marine ecosystems and are incredibly important for the survival of the ocean. They help maintain the balance of our marine habitats by grazing on seagrass beds and also controlling our jellyfish population, as an example. And their presence is a sign of a healthy environment, one that supports a very diverse collection of sea life. And I just want us to take a step back a little bit to see what a sea turtle goes through during its lifetime, and then uh, maybe you'll understand why we really want to conserve them. So for us to be more aware, more aware of a sea turtle's life, what you see in front of you is a typical sea turtle egg. They look like ping pong sized balls. They're very leathery to touch and any, any nest can have a range from 50, 120, some cases have reported about 200 eggs per nest. So these all are inside a female turtle and she is then guided by her internal compass to a beach that is very familiar to her one that she has emerged from 20, maybe 30 years ago. So the sea turtle finds a suitable location. She makes sure it's safe for her babies. She digs up the nest, she lays her eggs, she camouflages it, and then goes back to sea. She never returns to see them. She never returns to check on the kids. She does not teach them any secrets of the sea. So um, that's the end of her role. After about six weeks, 80% of the eggs will actually hatch. They, will, uh, they are now uh, making their way from the, um, from the nest itself to the sea. And as I mentioned, 80% will only hatch during this phase. From that journey, from the nest to the sea, they face a series of obstacles. One being pitfalls, crabs, gulls, debris, and other threats that sea turtles need to overcome That's to actually get to the shore. For ones that actually make it to the, uh, to the surf, they trade one set of threats for another. They fa first face the repelling force of the waves and then find a whole host of new predators awaiting for them. We have various fish, sharks, dolphins that find them a very yummy treat and seabirds can also pick them up once they come to the surface for some air. For the first few days of, the li of their life, they're out at the vast sea, swimming very frantically forward. They look for a patch of seagrass or seaweed to settle in. And for the next couple of months, they try to avoid being eaten while trying to find food for themselves. In the next couple of years, they grow in size from being the size of a dinner plate during their first year to the size of a dinner table, uh, at least that's the case for one species, which is the leatherback. And the only worrisome threats right now are their larger species of sharks, such as bulls, tigers, and whites, and the occasional killer whale. At approximately 20 years of age, the turtle is now ready to breed, and they're old enough to continue this cycle, which their very existence heralds. Of those that began as eggs on a distant beach, there is now less than 10% that survived. At least that was the case without humans involved. Historically, uh, what caused sea turtles to become in decline, and that drastic decline that we've seen, is because sea turtles were hunted. They were consumed as, uh, for their meat, their eggs were poached to be eaten, their oil was used, and because they have a very beautiful shell, as you can see, it was used to make jewelry, some were given as gifts, or even their shell was just used as a display item. Over the past several decades, our endeavors as humans have caused sea turtles to decline even further and to drop their survival rate to 1%. We have cases of habitat loss where the coastal development and human activities that are leading to the destruction of nesting sites as well as their foraging areas for them to lose their habitats. Pollution is one, 
regarded as marine debris or particularly plastics that can either be ingested by the turtles or become entangled in them. Bycatch, which is a fisheries-related uh, issue, where sea turtles be, uh, uh, get caught into fishnets that are either illegally used or discarded illegally. And to top all of that, we have climate change, where we have two main issues with climate change, so, which is the uh, temperature rise that can cause an imbalance to their sex ratio, and sea level rise, which can cause further habitat loss. I know I talked a lot about percentages, so I just want to recap on what we, I've just said. So the odds of a sea turtle surviving. So let's say we have 100 eggs. So the 100 eggs were laid. 80 of them would actually hatch. 40 of them would make it to the water. 20 of them would progress towards adulthood. Two of them would reach breeding stage without any human interference. And 0.2 would actually make it with human interference. So I just want that to sit with you for a minute, and we'll dive into Abu Dhabi sea turtles. Abu Dhabi's coastal and marine environments host four main species of sea turtles of the seven species found worldwide. We have the hawksbill turtle, which is classified as critically endangered, the green turtle, which is endangered, we have the loggerhead and olive ridley turtles, which are classified as vulnerable. However, only two are commonly found, and we see them in abundance in our waters, which is the hawksbill turtle, the only nesting species in Abu Dhabi, and the green turtle, which is found foraging in our waters. Abu Dhabi has taken steps that are there to protect our marine treasures. And just to highlight some of them, at the top of the list is the laws. So the laws were passed back in 1999, which not only protects sea turtles, but it also protects their habitats, such as coral reefs and seagrass beds. Our research and monitoring began in, two, in the year 2000, and this has focused not only on where the sea turtles are and what kind of species we have, but also where they nest, any tracking studies. We've also tried to identify the threats and where the hotspots are, where all this essential data will feed into our conservation strategies. From ongoing research and monitoring, we were able to identify the core nesting areas in Abu Dhabi. And from that, we have launched um, protection measures. And even though they might not be protected areas officially, but especially during the critical nesting and hatching season, we try to protect the beach as much as we can. And not only from the threats that I just mentioned, but also such as noise pollution, any light pollution on the beach, we try to seize it as much as we can. As I mentioned, some areas are not protected, but however, we do have six marine protected areas in Abu Dhabi, the largest of them being the Marawah Marine Biosphere Reserve, that includes 13 islands, and is a core nesting location and foraging area for our sea turtles. Rescue and, rehabilita rescue and rehabilitation com commenced in the year 2016 by EAD, and um, this program basically provides the necessary care for any injured or sick turtles with an end goal to release them back to their natural habitat. And as was just mentioned in the introduction, we uh, just completed two uh, releases just last week. Of course, uh, including everything that we do, we always try to incorporate education and outreach programs aimed at local communities, citizen scientists, schools, and other members of the public just to raise awareness about sea turtles, why they're important, and what we're doing for conservation, because we really believe that a person cannot advocate for the cause, even if they're not specialized in this field, unless they're equipped with the right information. The next few slides, I'll just give you snapshots of some numbers to give you some information about our sea turtles. As per the last survey, which is done by Aerial Survey in 2021, we have a population of 6,806 sea turtles of the four species that I showed you earlier. Our nesting season starts in March and ends in June of every year, while the hatching starts in June and ends in August of every year. In 2023, we recorded 247 hawksbill turtle nests, 
and we had an average of 94 eggs per nest, but in some cases it did go up to 120. The average incubation period, which is basically the period from when an egg uh, is laid until it hatches, so the average is 54 days. But here it also varies. So the earlier the sea turtle will nest, for example, if it nests in early March, the longer it will take the eggs to develop because of the cooler temperatures in the earlier months. And if they, for example, nest in June, the period might be shorter because the heat will make the development go faster. In 2023, we recorded a hatching success of 72%. So this basically means, again, if we have 100 eggs in one nest, 72 of them will uh, successfully hatch. As I mentioned, we've launched our rescue program in 2016, and we've so far rescued 1,242 sea turtles and released 8,600, uh, sorry, I hope it was 8,000, 864 sea turtles back to their natural habitat. I've highlighted some of our projects earlier and what we do on an annual basis, but there are some key projects that I'd like to uh, talk to you about that have uh, added to our information and have let us know more about our sea turtles to enhance our conservation measures. So to better understand the movement patterns of our hawksbill turtles, there was a regional project that, was, uh, that included four countries, the UAE being one of them, and it satellite tagged hawksbill turtles after they completed their nesting because we wanted to know more about their movement patterns, where they go to, to eat, and what kind of behavior they have. So 10 turtles were tagged from Abu Dhabi, and we, uh, as I mentioned, identified key foraging areas, and we also noticed that the sea turtles, the hawksbill sea turtle, that is in Abu Dhabi, does not migrate past the Gulf. So if you see these little lines, those are the areas that they move to. There was another uh, t tracking project, which was the Gulf Green Turtle Project that spanned over four years. And this was for us to know where our foraging turtles are going to nest. So we have a great number of green turtles in Abu Dhabi waters, but they don't actually nest here. So we wanted to know those that were ready to nest and had eggs inside of them, where they actually went to nest. And we saw that the majority took the same route. So they went up and across to Oman, they nested there, and then after they completed their nesting, they actually came back to Abu Dhabi to enjoy the seagrass beds that we have. From 2019 to 2021, we wanted to understand how temperature will impact our hatchlings. So we conducted an in-depth analysis on the effect of temperature within the nests in our beaches and we found that 79 to 96 percent of them were female which brought the ratio to six to one female to male ratio this also gave us more insight on this topic and we are conducting even further analysis from 2021 until now uh, just to really understand how how much it's impacting them or if they have some sort of adapt adaptation mechanism I've talked a lot, about, uh, a lot about science, but I really want to highlight our Sadiat Turtle Patrol. So Sadiat is very special because um, if you aren't aware, Sadiat was, did not have all this development before. And it was just the island and beautiful beaches and nothing was there. Sea turtles found that to be a perfect location for them to come and nest. When development started, Nesting ceased. We had a few years where no nesting was on Sadiat Island. We did not report anything. And of course, that was mostly due to the construction noise, the light pollution that was there, and the amount of traffic on the beach. After development was completed, the Sadiat Turtle Patrol was launched by Arabella Willing. If you know her, she is at Emirates Nature at the moment. So she led this group and she initiated this group, which now consists of more than 90 people. And some of them are here in the crowd. Um, and it's basically um, why I wanted to highlight this is because every morning when I'm also probably sleeping and maybe hitting the snooze button a couple of times, these people are out monitoring the beaches on Sadia. They're out 
patrolling not only to see if there's any nesting, but also to see if there's any issues, anything to report, any mortality, any stranded animals. So they're the, f the first people that can alert us and let us know uh, what's going on. When we spot a, a sea turtle nest, they are now more than aware of what to do. So really having that community with that passion and dedication to monitor this area every day in the heat is really um, pleasing for me and has added a lot to our information to know how Saadiyat is doing after being developed and having all the construction happening. Despite these efforts that we've done, Abu Dhabi sea turtles um, battle to save the sea turtles is far from over. And we all have a role to play. As I mentioned, you do not have to be a person that specialized in this field to really contribute to the cause. One, you can reduce your plastic waste and avoid using single-use material because, as I mentioned, it can either be ingested or turtles can be entangled in them. You could volunteer in organizations that, is de that are dedicated to uh, marine conservation and really help in, uh, for example, as I mentioned, what we just saw with the Sadiyat Turtle Patrol Group. Educate yourself and educate others about the importance of sea turtles and the challenges they face will really help in, uh, in the cause. And when you're ever out at the beach, I don't think I have to stress on this, but uh, respecting marine life as well as the habitats is key to uh, minimize disturbance. And you can always encourage practices that protect the marine environment and promote sustainable development. So I hope I gave you a bit of insight and that you now know that sea turtles are a vital part of Abu Dhabi's natural heritage as well as the global ecosystem. Their collective survival depends on our collective efforts and not just one person. And by supporting conservation initiatives and adopting eco-friendly practices, we can ensure that these magnificent creatures continue to flourish for future generations. And I'd just like to end by this quote, which is something that I resonated with a lot, and I hope you do too. And that's it from me. You can easily scan my QR code that has all my details if you ever want to connect or reach out for any questions or comments. Thank you again for being here. Um, I just want to say how nice is it to be working alongside uh, such a, an amazing person and Barbara is originally from Spain, not from far, for, for, so far from, from uh, me, from France, but I am uh, sure French. she has made the UAE her home uh, for uh, quite a very long time now. Uh, and she's fully caring and acting for the good of its marine environment. She has dedicated her life to rescuing injured turtles along the UAE shores. Um, and she will all uh, tell us about that, what she's doing uh, over there at the Dubai Turtle Rehabilitation Thank you. Thank you very much. I am actually quarter French. <laughs> see? You see? <laughs> I'm quite mixed. So, yeah, I've been here 20 years, um, and I've done a lot of this and a lot of other things as well. Um, I'm the director of the Dubai Turtle Rehabilitation Project, uh, who has been here, as Alice said, for 20 years. I'm sure you have seen images like this, uh, maybe in the media, because we've been around for quite a while. And um, we are the first in the region. No, we are not the only ones in the region, and I'm very happy about this. We are sitting today here in, in one fantastic marine rehabilitation facility. Uh, we started in 2004. And, and the reason why we started is because Burj Al Arab has the first aquarium, the first sizable aquarium in the region. And so we had the team and we had the facilities to look after these creatures. And in coordination with the Wildlife Protection Office, we started bringing turtles in. And since we started, we have so far rehabilitated and released 2,175 sea turtles from the species that Hint explained before. So, um, as 
per yesterday. Well, yesterday we released 63 turtles and we celebrated our 20th anniversary and we tagged eight with satellite trackers. So we have so far uh, tagged 86 turtles with satellite transmitters. Um, we do not do this in isolation. So we work from the beginning of the project with the Dubai Central Veterinary Research Lab uh, and they provide laboratory work for us. And we also work with uh, Sheikh Handam, the Crown Prince of Dubai, with his veterinary facilities in Alasifa Falcon Hospital in the Dubai Central Veterinary Research Lab. Or sorry, Alasifa Falcon Hospital and the Dubai Falcon Hospital. Um, I don't have a social media team for myself, but our Facebook is quite liked, so we have 16,000 followers. And uh, we have a couple of educational programs, and one of them is the school groups. So we get around 1,700 kids uh, coming every year. And you can visit us every day at 11 a.m. in Jumeirah Al Nasim, where we have educational sessions and the kiddies can help us feed in the turtles. Our objectives are very similar to the rest of the rehabilitation facilities in the country. We rescue, rehabilitate, and release back into the wild sick and injured sea turtles. And uh, we educate children, in our case, because we are a hospitality brand, uh, international hotel guests, as well as uh, local, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the residents of the UAE about turtle biology and, and uh, the issues that sea turtles face, which uh, Dr. Hind already explained to you about. So, this, sorry, the image is not very clear now. I don't know what happened there, but we, we wanted from day one to understand if what we're doing works. And the way to do that is to satellite tracking. So, you help a sea turtle, you release it back into the wild, and you're never going to see it again. And so all our turtles are microchipped. So if one comes back to the shore, any of the facilities in the country will let us know. Uh, but we use also satellite tracking so that we know that turtles do what they have to do after we release them. And we also can get vital information about their migrated, migratory behaviors. It's making something funny. Wait, sorry. Okay, so as I explained to you before, we have three stages. The rescue is done by all of you. So when you go out on a boat or when you're on the beach, sea turtles, when they are sick because they're reptiles and they breathe air, they tend to be at the surface. Sometimes they have lung infections or they have intestine impaction and they have gas and so they will be floating around. When a sea turtle is sick and stops moving, a lot of stuff grows on them. And so you're going to see that they have algae, they have barnacles and oysters growing in their carapace and they are unable to dive. And so if you see that and you are able to pick it up, it means the turtle is very sick. If it is not found that seed will end landing on a beach, right? So when you do that, I'm sure Dr. Elise will give you the call line for, re for marine rescue in Abu Dhabi. Uh, if you're anywhere else in the UAE or even if you're in Abu Dhabi, you can call 800 turtle and I will put you in contact with the adequate facilities, depending on where you are. Uh, when the turtles come to us, we have the critical care part of the project within Bursa Lara, in the back of house of the aquarium facilities is where we have our turtle hospital. And once the animals have gone through the critical care part of, the, of, of their rehabilitation, we move them to Yumeira Al Nasim. Has anyone here come to visit us in Yumeira Al Nasim? Okay, a few. Yes, yeah. so in Yumeira Al Nasim we have uh, five sea turtle rehabilitation pools. I'll show you some, some uh, photos later. And once they are fit to go, when the weather conditions allow, we release them off the beach. Anyone has been to any of our sea turtle releases? Okay, <laughs> there you go. Um, so as I explained to you before, the rescue is in hunter turtle. Please, very important, most of the animals we receive look like this. You see these little hawksbill turtles. Look at the amount of epibiota. Very often, the amount of marine life growing on the animal is heavier than the animal itself. So, as Dr. Hin mentioned, they are born this time of the year. If you're lucky to, uh, to witness a hatchling, it's a fantastic experience. And then, because sea turtles cannot regulate their body temperature, and the babies have a very immature uh, immune system, when they hit the winter months, even though the water here is not really very, very cold, for them it is, and then they get sick like the kids when they start the kindergarten, right? <laughs> so when they become lethargic, when the water is cold and they stop moving and then a lot of things start growing on them and then it's very heavy and difficult for them to swim and then they get washed onto the beach. When you find a turtle like this, please do not try to remove anything that is growing on the turtle. We have received 58 turtles that look like this this year and we lost four of them because people in good faith removed the barnacles. The barnacles are encrusted into the animal, right? So 
you literally pull chunks of turtle with them. So please refrain from doing that. Keep it out of the water, wrap it in a wet towel, and off you go. Um, common diseases I explained, in the winter time we receive more animals uh, when they get sick. Uh, sometimes they have parasites, sometimes they just have infections. Very often they have intestine impaction from eating plastics. Um, even turtles that come to us because they are entangled in a fishing gear or because they are hit by a boat, we monitor everything that goes through them and the majority of them do have some sorts of plastics in the digestive system. So please, just don't use single-use plastics. Avoid it as much as you can and if you cannot avoid it, recycle and control it. Yeah? Even recycling, it doesn't get recycled twice, right? So you are just prolonging the end, which is this. Yeah? Um, Vessel strikes, hollow propeller. I have to say, often when a turtle is hit by a boat, it's because the turtle was very sick and unable to escape. But it's not always the case, and we do have a lot, a lot of boat strikes here. Uh, intensive care, as I said, is in Buchalara, so they have a seven-star treatment, <laughs> the only seven-star hotel in the world. And once they are fit to go, well, these are our beds. Uh, we also have nice afternoon teas apart from <laughs> working really, really hard. And then the animals are moved to the turtle rehabilitation lagoons in Yumeira al Nasim. So these lagoons, well, at the beginning when we started, we have, if you've seen Medina Jumeira, we have the seawater canal, it's a few kilometers long, and then we build an enclosure because sea turtles are migratory species, as Dr. Heath uh, explained before, and they literally navigate, navigate thousands of kilometers within their nesting and feeding grounds. So when an animal is very sick and able to swim, sometimes out of the water for a while as well, they need to build up muscle strength and they need to put on some weight to be fit enough to go and do what they need to do. So this is what these lagoons are for. So in these lagoons we monitor if the turtles have good buoyancy, if they are eating okay, we take measurements regularly, we take blood samples regularly. Specifically the adults, as soon as they are ready to go, off you go. We want to make sure that we don't skip any nesting season. So if you ask me when are you going to release turtles next, I will tell you whenever one is ready to go. Um, this is where we have the school groups from October to April. We have schools from all the corners of the country coming to us. It's a free of charge activity. You can email us at dtrp at uh, from September when the school starts and we book the groups in and they get to enjoy Jumeirah breakfast as well. So it's a very popular activity. Sorry, it's just... Okay. And then eventually they get to be released. We had a fantastic event yesterday. Uh, we often release them just off the beach, uh, just in front of the hotels, basically but sometimes some animals are quite particular and a bit nervous and we want to make sure that we don't have any incidents. We cut the marine traffic around the area on the morning of the release, but some of the animals are released uh, by boats and some of them get released from other areas depending on where they came from as well. It's kind of buzzing, but it's not really... I think if you put yeah, it Yeah, the up. clicker is not working. Okay, I think I want a couple. Ah, oh, no, perfect. So obviously with, with all of this information that we have been acquiring over the years. I think if you point it up. Can you just pass the slide for me, maybe? It's kind of buzzing, I think it's the battery. It buzzes, but it doesn't really do much. Does this also work? No, no. This is for the laptop. Okay. Well. Yay. Okay, there you go. So we, we have written a few papers on satellite tracking and also a few medical uh, journals as well. And uh, this is our record, uh, Diva. She traveled more than 8,000 kilometers in less than nine months. And she went all the way to the coast of Thailand. So at the time when we recorded this, it was the longest trip for a green turtle ever recorded. And the first time a turtle has gone from here to the Southeast, uh, Southeast Asia. It's fantastic, she's quite famous. <laughs> yeah, can you just pass the slide for me, please? Because it's not really working. So we don't do this on, in isolation. Yes, we started looking after animals from all the country,
but obviously we need the cooperation from all the different authorities. So we have been working very closely with Abu Dhabi Environment Agency from day one. They had to do a lot of drives from Abu Dhabi to Dubai to bring turtles. Uh, obviously with Dubai Municipality as well. Uh, we have an MOU with Fujairah Environment Authority, so we do turtle rehabilitation for them, but we also help them with ecosystem restoration and, and, and some research. And of course, the wonderful Jesse World Research and Rescue Center, because they do have the best marine hospital facility in the world, and so for difficult cases, here they are. Uh, some examples, right? So. I like to talk about Leia. Leia is a female Hawksbill, uh, adult Hawksbill turtle, and uh, she was found stranded on the beach with uh, injury on her neck in the middle of the nesting season. So we took her in. The, the wound was actually kind of closing, and we took some blood samples, and she was fine, and she had wood buoyancy, and we just released her after five days. Yeah, We decided, OK, it's the nesting season. She looks fine. I don't know why she got stranded and the injury is closing and so there you go. Two weeks later she was nesting. So very important to make sure, specifically adults, they are endangered creatures. In the case of Hawksville, critically endangered. We need to let them do what they have to do. Uh, Jumeira, this is very similar to your maps, right? So Jumeira is a male green turtle. We released him, he went straight to Ras al Had, Ras al Jin's area in Oman, which is a green turtle nesting site. He spent a month there, guess doing what? And then he moved to Masira Island, which is another nesting site, and then he spent there four months, and then we lost signal. Yeah, so these are the stories that make us happy, that you know, when we let them go, we can still know where they go and that they are doing fine, and this animal was a very difficult case to treat, and he spent a year with us, and we know that he has produced a lot, a lot of babies, and that obviously makes us very happy and very proud as well. And this is the first time that an olive ridley has been tagged in this region. Um, this is the one we released from a boat. She was very sensitive and she was kind of getting sick again when she was nervous. And so we had to be very careful with her, keep her in a lagoon on her own, not much disturbance. Uh, and then uh, we released her best time of the year. We all like April here, yeah? Sunny, water starts to warm up a little bit. And then she went all the way to the olive ridley nesting sites in India. Oh, and if you don't know him, just Google Turtle Sheikh. This is Sheikh Fahim Al Qasimi. He's our turtle ambassador, uh, and uh, he's a free diver. He's actually a diplomat from Sarja Royal Family, and he started getting involved with the project three years ago because he was diving uh, on an offshore island from Sarja, and he found a sea turtle that was not able to swim because of a fishing line. And he cut the line, rescued the turtle, called Sarja authorities, they told him, take it to Jumeira, and then he came to visit the turtle pretty much every week, and then he helped us release it and shared a few tears, and since then, he's actually very, very involved with the project, and he's the one that set up the 800 turtle line, and uh, this is another of the turtles that we released, so as Dr. Hind explained before, some of them stay in the Gulf. Uh, we also monitor water temperature preferences. In the case of this uh, loggerhead, she was released in October, and October, the weather starts cooling, but the water is still quite warm. So the water was around 30, 31 degrees, and she didn't like it very much. Within six days, she was in Iran, in deeper, cooler waters, yeah? And then she spent a while there. Then when the water started cooling, she went around, she came to Qatar, and then started getting a bit hot, and then she moved again, and so that's what they did. Oh, that was fast. And this is Farah, so this is a Fahim turtle. And, uh, this helped us showing Dr. Hind how good her marine protected areas are. So as soon as we release turtles, they go and they just do pit stops in the marine protected areas where they have a lot of seagrass and they have a lot of food and they are respected. And you can see all those red big areas. Those are the areas that are protected. And I believe that sea turtle tracking data also help authorities making decisions of what areas are important for these animals. And uh, that's it from, for us. Thank you for being here. Actually, I will ask to move the chairs and I will ask you to come back on stage. We are going to start. Do we have a... Okay, time for 
I went over time, didn't I? Episode of Missy Hope. I will just introduce Dr. Clark. Dr. Clark. Yes. Yeah, we um, could. Come on. We should go. I'm very pleased to welcome on stage, obviously, someone who has, uh, who has been a very dear colleague of mine for three years now. Uh, Dr. Trey Clark is the Animal Health, well, Health and Welfare Director at Sea, sea World Yas Island, Abu Dhabi, and the Yas Sea World Research and Rescue Center. Uh, Dr. Clark is a true passionate vet who has been wanting to help animals for as long as he can remember. Am I, am I right? Yes. Um, and as the head of the animal health team, he has a lot of uh, a lot of to say about the rehabilitation of sea turtles um, as a facility here at the Yassi World Research and Rescue. Um, and I will ask Dr. King and Baba to come as well to join us. Everyone. <laughs> so, um, so yes, the rescue and rehabilitation is led by the Environment Agency, but it's not, honestly, it's the people who are out in the public, they're the ones that are our eyes in the field, and they're the ones that let us know if they come across anything. So the general number that they call is Abu Dhabi government number, which is 800 5 and that's where we get the call and then coordinate with the rescue centers uh, to see who who can go and pick it up and what the issue is. Right. Yeah. So everyone of us can go. Yes. Baba, yes. um, could you tell us what are the first steps of mobilization after receiving a call? So in our case, it depends where the turtle is found and what resources we have on that location. So for example, if the turtle is in Fujaira, uh, the Fujaira Research Center, so I will get a call on the 800 turtle. I will send the Fujera, I will send the Fujera Research Center the location, some photos and videos of the animal and the contact details of the person that found the animal and they will drive it straight to us. If the turtle is found in Ras Al-Khaimah, we work with an animal shelter there. Sometimes they collect the turtle and keep it for us until we can go and pick it up. So it very much depends. And in, in the case of Dubai and near in uh, Emirates, if it is uh, one of the little Hawksbills, very often the person that finds it, they just put it in a wet towel and put it in the car and bring it over. That's the fastest uh, way. So we always try to see what's the best uh, action plan. And also it depends obviously on the injuries or, or what is wrong with the animal. And we, that's why every time someone finds a turtle, we ask for videos and photos, just to make sure it's not a pet, because we get a lot of calls from people that yes. don't want their pets anymore, yeah? <laughs> no, you cannot imagine, we have people throwing their fresh water turtles into our turtle rehabilitation pools, and then we find them by seawater pools, right? So please, only call us when you find the sea turtle. <laughs> yes. um, could you tell us about the center and the team that is involved in sea turtle rescue versions and verification process? So, we have a, a really cool team, large team that consists of uh, our rescue staff uh, that's able to uh, have a lot of experience dealing with turtles, different animals, birds, uh, pretty much everything you can find in the beach, right? Um, and then, like Barbara and Dr. Hill say, really the challenge is getting the animal to us. Uh, that you're picking it up, so I'm coming in here, uh, bringing it here. And then once it's here, uh, that's really when the, the my team steps in, the veterinary team steps in, we take a look at it. First of all, you know, observation, just looking at the animals is the most key important thing. If we know what normal looks like, we can know what abnormal looks like. So uh, we start looking at that, uh, doing a regular physical exam, looking at uh, looking at its heart rate, uh, the shell will tell you, the shell condition will tell you a lot about that animal. Uh, we take x-rays that can tell us a lot as well. Uh, if an animal has pneumonia or hooks or any kind of debris, uh, sometimes we do CT or just very nice. Um, and then from there, we'll usually get blood work, and that tells us a lot about what's happening internally in the animal. 
So if like, there's liver issues, if there's low calcium, calcium is really important in our body helps contract things, so your heart being one of those main things. Um, and we can start to get, usually those animals are pretty dehydrated and there's something going on in our product, you know what I'm saying? They're sick, right? If we can catch them, they're sick. So we start the animals during a, a course of antibiotics. And after that, we kind of start figuring out, putting all the puzzles together and seeing what's going on. We kind of paint this picture of the health of the animal from there to help direct what we need to do. And I love turtles. Turtles are, uh, turtles want to live. Unlike other animals like rabbits, which are eight I'm dead, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, turtles are great animals, so you know, they really uh, are really hardy species and uh, they do really well. Uh, and we took a little, they, they, they take a little long to, to heal, but they heal. And so that's a that's really cool thing. So that's a little bit of our, our rescue facility. And then we take it over to Dr. Ed and Barbara, where we can release these animals. If I can just add, when uh, when you mentioned about the release, oh, sorry, the rescue being uh, one of the key things that we look at, because when we talk about Abu Dhabi, we're not just talking about the city where we are now, we're talking about the Emirates. So that's from here until the Silla, which is close to the Qatar border. So it's a, a very huge area, plus the sea and the islands offshore. So uh, we need all the people that we can get in the field uh, just to uh, spot them as soon as possible. Yes. And, and to add to that, uh, when we looked after the countrywide uh, turtle rehabilitation, around 80% of the animals came from Abu Dhabi, yeah? Because this is where the healthy habitats are, this is where the turtles nest, and this is the largest, uh, you have what, like 80% of the coastline as well, so that kind of makes sense. So. Um, okay, uh, I'd like to move Okay. Who is that? Hook. Baba. Yeah, that's my son Oliver. Yeah. <laughs> so this turtle is Hook. <laughs> uh, not a very original name, but uh, she came from Fujer in New Year's Eve. We love to work 24/7, 365 days a year. So that's what you get when you are getting ready to go to celebrate. And uh, as you can see in the photos from the boat, and uh, she has this really thick metal wire coming from her mouth. And so we, we could see that it's a really, really thick fishing hook. And it was uh, lodged in the esophagus of, of the animal. And this is a very big animal. It's a very complex surgery. And uh, because we have the best turtle bed and the best hospital here, we called Dr. Clark. And our veterinarian came with us. and. Uh, we ask uh, Dr. Clark to give us a hand, and there's other photos you can see of the surgery. So, and I guess that, yeah. perhaps you want to explain what, how challenging was that? Because you can yes. see, I think this is every single uh, veterinary. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> every, every single veterinary uh, plus one. It's a VIP turtle. It's a very, very intense uh, surgery. Yeah. So, What's a really cool thing about the natural history and evolution or anatomy of turtles is that when you open up their mouth, it looks like an alien. It looks like jaws. There's little, what's called a papillae, and it's like little daggers that go down the throat. And that's to prevent anything coming back up, right? So when they uh, crab or, or shrimp or something that they move, they, uh, they eat it, and it prevents those little papillae moving down, prevent anything coming back up so that a turtle gets it gets what it needs to eat. However, when you have something foreign, like a giant hook, uh, that's back because that hook's not coming up. Uh, so this is a, a massive hook, probably about... Uh, Eight centimeters? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was around. Yeah, yeah, no, sorry, yeah, yeah. it was around eight centimeters. And it was on a, um, a braided lead line, which was really a high tensile strength. And so this thing was lost all the way down, uh, almost to the turtle stomach. And that, requires a lot of, uh, you can't, sometimes we, we can actually physically remove the, uh, remove the hook just by grabbing it with our, our hands or some instruments that we specially created, and we can actually kind of wiggle the, the hook out. If a, if a hook's been swallowed for a long time, your body naturally wants to get rid of it, right? So, or the hook kind of sets into it. So sometimes we have this massive amount of tissue that forms around it, which can be a really big problem, because once it pierces, 
Uh, the esophagus it goes through, and many, many turtles when that happens. Uh, that's, that's kind of the descent almost for that turtle. Uh, for, so for this guy, luckily, uh, our team were able to bring it down fairly quickly, and uh, we knew the, the fishermen that caught it, we knew when it happened, so we knew this was a fairly acute issue. Um, and we initially, we, we went at this turtle twice. Um, so one, we tried to, we, we tried to soak it, we, me, we soaked it first, to, so we took a video camera, a little small video camera, and went down the throat, that's the one, the, the bottom one. Uh, we were able to, uh, to find it and see that it was pretty well lodged in there. If you guys just kind of notice up, if you guys that are, ever catch a turtle on a line, don't yank it, right? That one sets the hook more. So unfortunately, the, you know, the fisherman didn't know that, and this was really, really embedded into the, into the tissue. Uh, so it took a lot of us. Uh, we actually opened up, uh, we got uh, an exercise turtle. Um, turned it on its back, we actually made an incision kind of right here uh, where the, the throat meets the plastron, which is the bottom part of the shell. Uh, even then, the hook was further down, so I kind of had to involute the, or bring up the, the esophagus up from its body to actually get to the, to the hook. And once we had it, we had to hold on for dear life because that hook was trying to get back down into yeah. its natural position. Uh, and then once we had it, we couldn't just easily take it out of the, of the esophagus because it was going to tear the whole esophagus out. It's got this barb. Yeah, it, it was barbed too. You guys can kind of see on the bottom. It was a pretty thin barb. So we, in, in zoo medicine, we have to, I call it American units, but we MacGyver the hell of stuff, right? So we have, there's nothing in the world that they make specifically for c surgery. Nothing. So we have to come up with a lot of different things. Uh, we actually uh, took a clean dribble. Uh, we kind of isolated it from the tissues, and we dribbled uh, a part of the hook off. So we took the make as you guys can see in the bottom. We made it into two pieces. So we took the big part of the of the hook out, and then we we're able to kind of go in surgically, make a little bigger hole, and actually find the, that bar out. So that took what it was like almost it was two hours. four veterinary surgeons, four hours, yeah. and then it took like three hours for her to wake up after yeah, the surgery. Yeah. They and like to sleep. To, so. You have to put Humpy Dumpy back together again, right? <laughs> so now we have all those papillae that are meant to keep things in are now working against you. Uh, so we have to do multiple uh, sutures, many sutures, since what you don't want to do, you just create a giant hole in the turtle's neck. Not a good thing, right? Um, and you want to make sure it stays closed because if the turtle eats, you don't want to just, just swap it back out. That's, that's not good. Uh, we, we've got that's that good. out there. Uh, and so uh, we're able to suture back up and like it throws through everything very slow. So three hours later, animals able to wake up and Barbara took it back to her team. We did an amazing job of rehabbing this turtle. They were able to feed it, uh, which is a, a testament to itself. And, just and she was released yesterday yeah. with a satellite tracker. <laughs> and and Dr. Tres didn't come. He was very busy. And uh, yeah, she's, uh, this morning she was somewhere around the world islands. So we are going to see where it goes. I'll send you the link to the map so that you can see where it's going. Hopefully, I haven't found any more birds. And this is my weekend. So, you know, my kids are kind of turtle rescuers because I'm sure that you also know Dr. Hint. Uh, we find more turtles in the winter months and we find more turtles in the weekends. Do we find more turtles in the weekends because they like to go to the beach? No, it's because you go to the beach and that's when you find them, right? So specifically, please, after a storm, if the sea is rough, that's when they land on the beach, right? So stormy day, you have nothing to do, go for a walk. And there are times of the year where it's actually quite good chances that you're going to find a little hogsfield stranded on the beach. Yeah. We have people that have rescued turtles three years in a row, yeah, so big chances. And if you find it in Dubai, we will invite you to release it. So there you go. That's a plus. Um, I think that's another question from the, uh, yeah. the public now. So if you have uh, the first turtle that was Saturday, and after that I wanted 
What would happen if a turtle wasn't able to go back to the beach where it was born the legs? Like because of an algae bloom or something, like theoretically, let's go. So, um, yes, so sea turtles have, we've seen, uh, not maybe because of the cause that you mentioned, but other, due to other issues such as coastal development on the beach that they came from, what they do is they will move somewhere close by. So if there's an island or a beach that is suitable for them close by, they will just move there. But that's why we, but we do prefer preserving their natural beach as well. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Another question on this side, over there. So my question is like sea turtles, I've heard that they that people have found myrtles in their stomachs. So why do they uh, take eat the turtle the myrtles? Uh, this is a very good question. Why would the turtle eat plastic? So when plastic breaks into smaller pieces. Um, algae starts growing on it, and then it smells and looks like animal food, right? So all the fish and all the turtles are just gonna go and eat it because they think it's their food, right? So any sort of plastic after a few days will get covered in algae, and then turtles will not be able to distinguish it. And if you uh, allow sea turtles to have jellyfish on their menu, and if you put a jellyfish and a plastic bag next to each other, it's very hard to tell the difference. So a lot of turtles eat. Uh, no, I think they, they, <laughs> they covered the top. <laughs> Hello. Hello, uh, my name is Sarah. I'm a fresh graduate, actually. Uh, I studied environmental and health management, and I was just wondering what are like challenges you guys have faced, and how was it overcome? Sorry, did you get that? Okay. Uh, what are the challenges that you have faced while we have been facing um, the turtles and how would you over overcome these challenges? Do you do not have any stuff? No, I have changed. I can give you less. Uh, <laughs> I will talk about the medicine book because these ladies yeah. do amazing job on that. Uh, yes, uh, there's been many challenges uh, with turtles that, you know, I've been lucky enough, fortunate enough to do many different turtles from all over the world. Uh, and I've seen some very interesting cases, uh, turtles that have been eaten half by sharks and they still want to live, and uh, turtles that have been hit by boats and actually have a hole in their head. Uh, so some of the challenges that we face is, uh, A, trying to heal that one lesion or the major problem, and then once again, you have to remember those major problems, your body's connected, so everything has a uh, cause and effect. So, um, trying to, one problem is solved, another problem happens. So, uh, trying to work past those, you have to be very creative in our field, um, both on the rehab side, and you know, now you have a turtle that is healing on the men, uh, how do you feed that turtle? How do you give them access to water? Uh, so, these are a lot of, we get a lot of challenges in the process, but we overcome that by being very creative, uh, making things that, you know, using uh, bed pillows to be pillows for, for children recovery, uh, having little noodles for floats. Uh, we, we come up with some crazy stuff, but it's all in the health for the turtle so that's, that's my answer to that question. From the rescue point of view, I would say the challenge is awareness. Uh, we work very hard. Uh, trying to educate everyone about what to do, how to spot a sick turtle, but also what to do when they find one. And uh, the UAE is a beautiful country where population changes quite a bit, and so you train all the lifeguards in the city, and then the next year you have a different team, and then they will remove the barnacles and throw the turtle back into the sea, or you know, be able to reach the fishermen, be able to reach the authorities, be able to reach all the power plants and make everyone understand that we're here to help. And so we need every one of you to help us with this awareness because it's, it's an ongoing, we can never stop, right? So I know that there is many turtles there that are not getting help just because either people 
don't recognize that they need help or because they don't know what to do or because they, in good faith, do the wrong thing, right? So you know what to do? 800 triple five, yes. right? And 800 turtle, <laughs> so there you go. Yes, uh, just to add to your awareness point, of course, uh, like I mentioned, because we cover a very huge area, so uh, having everyone know what to do and how to act and how to take care of it until the rescue team either arrives or is delivered to the rescue centers. I think when we first started as EAD in 2016, our challenge was we did not have specialized people who can cater to such as what we just saw to, with the with the hooks and everything. So our rehabilitation was very basic. We only were able to do uh, minimal uh, rehabilitation, such as removing barnacles and all of that. So I am really grateful to the rescue centers that are here now because we can really ensure that these turtles are, are back and healthy uh, before we send them uh, back to their natural habitat. So I would like to ask you, is there an opportunity so that we could like shadow you or like have an internship here at the rescue center? We're working on it. Well, we don't throw on your ass. I'm working on it. We, at least and I are steadily working on it. We're almost there, but hopefully soon. So we can she can be your first. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I can see myself in you, so I'm so proud of you. Thank you so much. Uh, and probably in Dubai, do you guys fight for turtles? Do we fight for turtles? <laughs> in the border? <laughs> no, we don't fight. I, mean, I think <laughs> the, the, the quick answer is there is so many sick turtles. Honestly, and so, you know, as I said before, 80% of the turtles we received in the past were from Abu Dhabi, but some years we were having 350, 370 animals in a year. That's really a lot for my team, so we, we did what we could, but it's actually a lot. So it's actually a very good thing that there is more facilities in the country. Yes. Thank you, guys. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, Thank you so much, and that was really a great talk. I'm from Hannah, and fortunately I did my PhD in the marine turtles with GIS and techniques. Oh, wow. So, yeah. So I have been going through with lots of 30 years data and all. My question is that are you actually collaborating with the international on international level particularly because these are the foraging uh, species we have and they are most of the air they are around the other beaches and seas where the other countries are responsible for their uh, health and care as well so what are uh, actually initiatives have you been taken in the in terms of the collaboration with the international level, at the international level particularly thank you yeah. Uh, so the UAE is signatory to the Indian Ocean Southeast Asian Memorandum of Understanding on sea turtles. And that is basically countries that are signatory, they come together every year. We have one in two weeks time, it's going to happen in Tanzania, where we present what we uh, currently found, uh, other countries share information and expertise, and if there is any cross-country collaboration that can be initiated, that is the place to talk. We also have a regional committee within the GCC that also caters to this. And uh, as I mentioned with the satellite tracking, we've seen a lot of them go to Oman. So there's a lot of conversation between uh, both countries on that level as well. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, how can we at, at National History Group 
CEPA, a citizen science project for the turtles in winter. As far as I know, we have in the winter the juvenile hospital turtles that are badly affected and often collected by people because they are full of barnacles, so there's underlying diseases. In the summer, we have the, mainly the adult green turtles suffering massively because of problems with the gut due to the increasing temperatures in the Gulf. And I think we have a couple of people that go out with the boat, um, that monitor the beaches, and um, I find the only uh, point where citizen science, scientists actually get involved is the monitoring of the turtleness. And I would appreciate when we could discuss maybe together to, um, to create a more advanced program. For example, we found last winter on one of the islands a dead turtle, just a skeleton remained, but we could still see there was a, a fish hook in one of the flippers. So I think all these, these um, cases should be um, acknowledged, and, and so it would be, I think, good when we as a natural history group could do something together with you, and we will try also to involve a little bit Sorbonne University and Czech students, everyone who's out with the boat to, to do things like this, not only for the birds like we did before. Mm -hmm. So maybe you have ideas how we yes. can cooperate and include all members to this. Definitely. So just to, to, to uh, mention again, what we have on Saadiyat as an example, we can consider it as a pilot program because that's where it started and that's where we have something going on. And even though they monitor turtle, uh, turtle nests, it's not the only thing that they do. They also monitor for any strandings, they monitor for any mortality, and they know how to report it. Uh, volunteer members, especially the team leads, have been trained on how to excavate the nests to do the hatching success as well how to relocate nests, so it's not just uh, the walk on the beach that uh, is for the turtle, uh, monitor, turtle nest monitoring. So something similar can be replicated any, anywhere else because I personally see that as a successful program and can be incorporated anywhere across Abu Dhabi Emirates. Yes, yeah, so maybe we should discuss definitely. a little bit. Yes, yeah. Yeah. definitely. Okay, I'll take a more. <laughs> he's been, yeah, he, he, he's been lift raising his hand for a like, So our data sets go back to the year 2000, that's when we initiated our sea turtle program and this includes where we found nests, where we've, uh, where, how many have hatched, uh, the exact pin locations of the nests, if there has been any changes, what uh, other things we've monitored uh, in terms of changes in vegetation in the area. So our data does go back to the year 2000 and we have an environmental database within the environment agency where all of it is stored. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Well, yes. I would like to extend to two more. I'm curious, uh, once you find a sea turtle, how do you transport it once it, if it needs rehabilitation? Like, how do you get it to and from the beach? It, it depends on the, on the, on the size of the turtle and how wide it is. So I. From my side, I would ask you to send me a video, like WhatsApp with a video, to see what, how the animal looks like. If you have a 150 kilogram sea turtle that is cracked in, five, in half from a boat strike, then just call SeaWorld. <laughs> I don't want to deal with that one. <laughs> 
No, if, if, if it is a small turtle that is breathing okay, and it's okay, I would ask you to put it in a wet towel, and if you can come and bring it, then, then it would be a tremendous help, because you save half of the time by us not having to go. If it is a large animal, or if it is in a very bad shape, then we will just go and collect it, and then we will transport it for you. But very, very important, keep them out of the water, keep them cool, then put them in the sun in a very hot place, wrap them in a wet towel, something like that. If you put water, it has to be below the nostrils. Very sick turtles, sometimes they cannot lift the head properly to breathe. And so, especially if you put them in a bucket of water and you're driving, the turtle can just not breathe. Same with a sea snake, correct? So that's kind of important to remember that reptiles breathe air, yeah. Right. I have a very small question. Very small question. How long do seagulls live? Thank you very much. Now you're there. Sorry, come on. Seagulls live a long time. And to be honest, we are just now starting to crack the surface of how actually long we live. The, the amount of time that we've been studying doesn't really tell all the extra. So we need to estimate, you guys see who we find in Nemo, 100 years is not far off from how long they live. And we are still, we are, uh, there's lots of studies that can look at if an animal dives or strands or and then dies, so we can look at the humor bone and just kind of like the rings of a, a tree that can sometimes give us a small indication. It doesn't mean it's accurate, uh, but it can give us a small indication of actually how old that is. It's it's very difficult because they don't get wrinkles and they don't lose teeth. So <laughs> we need people like Dr. Tress to find out how old they are. I wouldn't be able to tell you. From the size, yes, but they reach a certain size and then they get lost. So. Depends on the place in the UAE, so we would get a lot from Fujaira, for example, but then in, in Dubai there is not so much fishing and they use different types of hooks as well, so it depends on the area um, and depends on the species of turtles as well. So in these cases with the large hooks, we will be mostly the lower heads. It will not be so much a green turtle. But we do get a lot of intestine impaction in green turtles because there is like plastic threads entangled with the seagrass and it all creates like a hard mass and it just the turtle will absorb all the water from that and it becomes like a solid that cannot pass through. And for us, I mean, there are very severe cases that is very difficult to treat, but a lot of the turtles that eat plastic, because turtles are so resilient, 
by the time they land on the beach, they may have spent several months without taking in any food. And they are really emaciated, and sometimes they already have necrotic tissue in the intestine, and, and often there is not much we can do, unfortunately. So. I, I, I'll, I'll answer that with it's sometimes it's a seasonality thing, too. Yes. So in the winter months, we're going to see cold stunned turtles, right? So the turtles that are uh, malnourished, uh, they're too cold, they can't metabolize, and those animals are going to have pneumonia. Versus summertime, we're going to see higher activity of humans out in the water, fishing, things like that. Uh, so it's actually more of a seasonality thing than in first time. What's our most common? All right. Thank you. Um, I think we're in a close question here because we have to stay much longer. Um, I hope you can speak a little bit there a bit longer. So if you have a question that uh, you want to ask, then come over. Thank you for coming. This was a very, very nice evening. Thank you. Thanks, Alice. Thank you for coming and for attending here. Because for us, we have to tell us a bit more about you. Uh, and then, of course, of the US Thank you for that. Uh, thank you for speaking about it. Um, next time, it's in uh, the 4th of July. On the 4th of July, so we're going to do the spring this time, I think. Um, and we will talk about reptiles still, but with reptiles from uh, the desert.